Welcome to the Phoenix Archaeology Cafe. I'm Bill Doley from Archaeology Southwest. I see a lot of familiar faces here, but uh, in case you aren't uh, familiar with the process here, we're going to be having a very informal uh, presentation tonight. Uh, no PowerPoint. Uh, we'll be trying to speak in languages that uh, everyone understands. Uh, Archaeology Southwest's mission uh, is to preserve and protect the places of our past, and this is, research is an important part of that, uh, public outreach and protecting archaeological sites. So that preservation archaeology message is uh, really served by getting informal groups together like this. And now to bring uh, Dr. Barbara Mills of the University of Arizona's School of Anthropology, and she's going to be talking about current debates in archaeology. And I think Barbara accomplished one of the most amazing things down at the University of Arizona, which was to bring, if, if we all know, I think, that two archaeologists, two anthropologists uh, come together, there's at least two or three opinions. And the idea that you can uh, get a, a discussion uh, perhaps an argument going very quickly if you get uh, two folks together. But Barbara managed to weld together an amazing diversity of uh, fields and subfields of anthropology into the School of Anthropology down at the University of Arizona. So that she wants to talk about debates. Uh, this is a woman who's been involved with, uh, I think, many uh, and very successfully uh, managed to turn, uh, keep debates uh, very civil and constructive. And I think uh, she's here to share with you uh, some of the current debates in, in anthropology, archaeology. And in the back table, the issue of Archaeology Southwest magazine, that uh, the research that Barbara was involved in a collaboration with Archaeology Southwest is also featured. So. I will turn the floor over to Dr. Barbara Mills and she will talk about current debates in Southwest archeology. span Barbara. Okay. Thank you, Bill. It's great to see everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's nice to see familiar faces. Uh, my Desert Foothills chapter uh, friends, where I gave a talk not too long ago on our social networks project are here and lots of professionals and uh, folks who are interested in Southwest archaeology. So I'm very delighted to be able to talk about uh, things that are close to my mind. Um, so why uh, did I pick such an ambiguous topic? <laughs> You're probably wondering. Um, what is she going to talk about? <laughs> so recently, uh, the past year, I have been involved with editing um, a compendium. Uh, it's called the Oxford Handbook of Southwest Archaeology. Shameless plug, because I hope you will all buy it in about a year from now. Um, it has 50 chapters and something like 75 authors. Uh, so I have been very close to a lot of the debates that have been happening in Southwest Archaeology. And I had to pick a few uh, to talk about tonight. I am going to talk about them under the umbrella of migration. But before I do that, um, I wanted to mention a couple of debates. Well, some of them have to do with uh, migration uh, that I'm not going to go into in detail, but which I think are really uh, very interesting. Uh, if you're interested in the early part of the archaeological record, like the first 10,000 years of Southwest archaeology, my interests are mostly in the ceramic period, which is the last 2,000 years. So uh, I wanted to uh, give some uh, attention to those earlier time periods and mention two very key debates that I think are happening now in archaeology. One of them has to do with the uh, megafauna extinctions that happened at the end of the Pleistocene. And that is a very, very interesting uh, debate that's going on. Um, my undergraduate students always latch on to that topic uh, in terms of paper writing because they love the arguments and they have not been solved yet. 
Uh, and the, the debates are around three different theories uh, about the megafauna extinction, whether or not it had to do with climate change or overkill or overhunting uh, by paleo-Indian hunters, or the latest that has come into the literature is the comet theory. So those are really wonderful um, debates that are going on in paleo-Indian archaeology. And Todd Surville gave an Archaeology Southwest uh, Archaeology Cafe in Tucson not too long ago. So if you're interested in paleo-Indian, that's all I'm going to talk about. But I do send you to the Archaeology Southwest website so you can take a look at that particular uh, video and get uh, a little bit more about the paleo-Indian uh, debate. The second debate that I'm not going to go into too much, but I think is very, very important for Southwestern archaeology, has to do with the um, uh, ideas around the adoption of agriculture, and particularly corn in the Southwest about 4,000 years ago. And the debates around that do have to do a little bit with migration, uh, because one of the sides of the debate is that people uh, migrated and brought uh, domesticates with them from um, Mexico, where we know that corn was originally domesticated. And then other people have been debating whether or not there was a migration, whether or not we need to rely on migration in, in order to be able to explain the adoption of agriculture, or whether or not we could explain it by a more down the line, uh, family to family or neighbor to neighbor kind of uh, transmission process. So that's another very key debate that's happening in Southwest archaeology. And you know, I think the key is going to be found in northern Mexico. Uh, I think that's where we need to do more research in order to be able to figure out exactly how that happened. So um, those two are, I think, very key debates that are happening in uh, the first, say, 10,000 years of Southwest prehistory. Uh, I'm going to focus more on uh, some uh, debates that are happening around the topic of migration, but much more recent in the archaeological record. And I'm going to focus on the topics of the Four Corners depopulation and where those folks went to after they left the Four Corners. Now, how many people here have been to Mesa Verde? Oh, good. <laughs> and how about Hovenweep? <laughs> Oh, good, yeah. Navajo National Monument, Kayenta Area Archaeology. Excellent. So you know what I'm talking about when I talk about the northern Four Corners. Now, my friends who work in Mexico are always saying, well, you know, there's another Four Corners. That's the intersection of Arizona and New Mexico and Sonora and Chihuahua. So we, we have to call it the northern Four Corners, but I'll probably slip and call it the Four Corners for the rest of this evening. Uh, so the question is really one that is perennial in Southwestern archaeology. It's a, a couple of questions. And the late Linda Cordell, who was one of my mentors, wrote a short piece about this. Um, and we all come back to sort of the same uh, kind of trope, which is, um, you know, why did they leave and where did they go? And we haven't solved the problem. We haven't established definitively where, why they left and where they went, but I think we have come a very long way. However, there are some really interesting debates that are happening, and that's what I'm going to do uh, for the next, say, 25 minutes, which is to talk a little bit uh, in, uh, about some of those uh, specific debates that are happening. Um, why did they leave and where did they go? Okay. So I'm going to be talking um, mostly about um, the, the Central Mesa Verde and the Kayenta migrations. And I'm going to take them a little bit separately. Um, but let's start first um, with why did they leave? So one of the major, uh, the period that we're talking about is the AD 1200s. And most archaeologists have uh, reconstructed that the depopulation of the Four Corners happened in the decades between about 1230 and 1280. And this is mostly based on tree ring record. And we have wonderful tree ring record for this time period. And does anybody know 
what happened during that time period or overlapping with that time period that might have been used as an explanation for why people left. The drought, it always comes up. So 1276 to 1299, and that is not false precision, that is based on the tree ring record. Uh, and if anybody has not been down to see our new tree ring lab building, I urge you to come down. But uh, the University of Arizona's pioneering work in tree rings um, allowed this great drought period uh, to be identified. So the great drought has been blamed uh, for the depopulation. But then Carlo Van West, um, about 15 years ago, uh, came up uh, with a simulation model and said, well, you know, it wasn't that bad. Some people could have stayed. Some people could have remained. Uh, they could have still grown enough corn uh, to be able to live in the area. Uh, and so this, was, this debate um, was in there. So why did people leave? So other explanations had to be brought forth in order to be able to explain wh why people left. And um, there's been a lot of very uh, wonderful recent uh, work on environmental reconstructions uh, that have pointed out a couple of other problems that, were, that people were facing in environmentally. And one of them is that it was extremely cold, uh, particularly in the time period right before the Great Drought. And so this is a good explanation for why people were leaving, especially in earlier than 1276, because people were already starting to leave uh, the Mesa Verde area in particular uh, before 1276. So that helped to kind of build an argument about why people were leaving. And then Jeff Dean, um, emeritus professor at the Laboratory of Tree Ring Research and the School of Anthropology came up with a, yet another idea, still environmental, but what he came up with was that there was a period of time starting in 1239, in which, uh, during which the climate got more unpredictable, more chaotic, and basically, um, created a situation in which p farmers could not tell whether or not they were going to have a good year or not because a lot of the, the factors that they were using in the past, they could no longer rely on. And so this it sort of w it was a really good kind of um, way of being able to uh, help explain why people were leaving earlier than the great drought, um, but it was still an environmental reconstruction. And so a, a lot of the more recent debates have been about, well, what about violence? What about uh, the uh, incidence of conflict that we have evidence for? And so there's been a very big camp in archeo Southwestern archeology span who have pointed out that there's earlier evidence for violence. There's a, lot in, there's a lot of evidence for violence now in the Southwest. And I think it was um, Andy Darling you know, who talked about the swing and the pendulum from Hobbes to, Rous to Rousseau and uh, how we really need to pay attention to conflict. And that was a, a decade ago. And a lot of archaeologists are rethinking the role of conflict and violence, in, particularly in the depopulation of the Mesa Verde area. And it turns out that there is a lot of evidence in the 1200s. There's also evidence in the 1100s. And there's also evidence in the Pueblo I period, even earlier. In fact, very dramatic evidence. And Tim Kohler very recently uh, put together um, some statistics on incidents of violence in the general Mesa Verde area, uh, in the San Juan, and the um, population size. And it turns out there is a very strong correlation of population size. In the P1 period, population went up, incidents of violence went up, and then there was a drop, uh, a trough in the population curve, and then it went back up again. Uh, so that tends to support um, some uh, discussion of, or, um, uh, of violence in the record uh, for the 1200s, particularly in the decades uh, right before and during the depopulation of Mesa Verde. But Jeff Dean, here comes Jeff Dean again, and Jeff Dean pointed out that 
the Kayenta area does not have very much evidence for, in, for violence. Uh, and so we can't use the violence argument uh, for the depopulation of the Kayenta in the same way that we can for the Mesa Verde area. And so there are real differences, even though both areas were depopulated during the uh, 1200s, in particular, you know, the middle 1250 to 1280. Uh, and you really don't have any triggering dates after about 1290 in any of these areas. Um, our social networks project has come up with yet another possible explanation that might be added. And one of our graduate students who works on the project, Louis Bork, who is a preservation fellow uh, at Archaeology Southwest in Tucson, uh, did some recent analyses. And one of the things that he noticed was that, this is for the Kayenta area, that they had very, very tight social networks with very few strong ties to other areas, to other people lying outside the Kayenta area. And so one of the things that Lewis is, um, has written about uh, in an article that is now under review uh, is that uh, maybe the Kayenta area were too inward focused. Maybe you know, they too had the environmental problems. They too were hit with some of these cold weather, uh, not enough rain, unpredictable rain kinds of situations. Maybe, maybe they didn't have as much violence, but maybe they, they didn't have the social networks to be able to rely on a big support system. And, and that's one of the things that we are pretty sure that Southwestern farmers needed was a big support network. And by, by getting too closed in their networks, by being too inwardly focused, that they might have actually um, uh, created a situation in which they um, had to move fairly long distances in order to be able to establish themselves uh, in new areas because they didn't have that kind of local support system and they didn't have these very strong ties with a lot of their neighbors. And so that's one of the things that we're, we're starting to think about. But I think um, just to summarize this part of my presentation, I think what this points out is that we can't use a single cause for arguing for depopulation. We can't just say it's the environment. We can't just say that it's climate uh, or, or violence. We can't just say that it's social networks. We have to look at all of these together. The second uh, conclusion that we can make about this is that different areas have different historical trajectories. And so there we, have, we look at things in, in terms of their past and we look at them in terms of where they are going in the future and we can't use the same explanation for all of them. It has to be multi-causal and it has, we have to rely on multiple lines of evidence in order to be able to make a good argument. So one, one argument is not going to make um, a good um, a reason or explanation for why people left. Okay. So that's um, sort of my take on some of the debates that are happening on why they left. I mean, there are many more things that we could talk about, and I hope you have some questions at the end. But now what I'd like to do is turn to um, where did people go? And I think that if you polled 10 archaeologists and said, well, what's one of the biggest debates that has to do with migration? They'd say, okay, the Mesa Verde migration to the Rio Grande area. And that is a very, very hot topic right now um, because there are a lot of archaeologists who are working on the, the issue, a lot of people who are thinking about it very, very hard, a lot of recent analyses that have been done. Some of them have not even been published uh, fully, or even the debate has not been published fully, but I'm gonna let you in on a little bit of a, a, um, a debate that I think is going on, that I think, um, and I think that a lot of archeologists have been uh, following. And uh, what I'm gonna do is basically give you the cons first. So um, we're gonna have a pro and a con kind of set up here as a debate should be. So let's take the con side. Why not support 
the uh, migration of Mesa Verde people to the Rio Grande. Well, interestingly, the con side of it is mostly people who work in the Rio Grande. It's, most, it's a lot of people who have been working there for decades, working there for a very, very long time. And they argue, and I'm not going to mention any names here, although I know that my, my, some people would like it. <laughs> but th what, they, what they point out is that there was always, or there is um, a good record of high population before the Mesa Verde migration. And so there were a lot of people living in the Rio Grande region uh, prior to the 1200s. And so you can't just use population size uh, as a factor in why people um, should support a migration from the Mesa Verde to the Rio Grande. Um, other archaeologists uh, point to continuity in occupation. They point to continuity in um, the locations of occupation in general. They also point out the continuities in the ceramic technology. Uh, in particular, that there is a long history of uh, ceramics in the area and that we don't see disjunctures, we don't see sudden change in the ceramics that would be supported by uh, a Mesa Verde migration uh, to the Rio Grande. And Mesa Verde people made beautiful black and white pottery, carbon paint for the most part, some mineral, on a beautiful white slip. And carbon paint has it, some antecedents in the Rio Grande area. So they, the archaeologists who are um, on the con side of the Mesa Verde migration to the Rio Grande would say, well, you know, we really don't see on the, the surface attributes, we don't see change in that. Uh, some archaeologists have even argued that there are real differences in the way that the pots are built. Um, for example, Eric Blinman uh, shared um, uh, some of his knowledge of technology with me and pointed out that Mesa Verde coiling, is the coils are added on the outside, whereas some of the groups where people are arguing that the Mesa Verde people moved to, the coils are added on the inside, which is a real difference in technological uh, construction or style that would be hard you know, to change overnight because people you know, do those things uh, as part of communities of practice and they learn them through transmission um, through mother, daughter, or um, aunt and daughter. We think that most pottery was probably made by women. But that, that's um, an argument against uh, the um, the migration from the Rio Grande. Um, the pro side is very interesting because um, it comes with uh, multiple lines of evidence that um, helps to explain some of the characteristics that uh, the con side have used to argue against. Okay, so demography, um, the pro side um, has suggested based on quantitative analyses that um, the increases in population are greater than what you can explain by natural birth rates. And so there had to have been some additional population that moved into the area. Um, another one on, on the pro side um, is that there are traditional uh, histories of Pueblo people, contemporary and historically documented Pueblo people, who talk about their migration from the Mesa Verde area. So it's in the oral histories that have been documented by anthropologists and archeologists for land claims, for a number of different projects. And so the Pueblo people themselves have histories that relate back to the Mesa Verde area. And then um, another argument, and, and a lot of this has been written up by uh, Scott Ortman in his recent book, very, uh, which I highly recommend, called Winds from the North. Um, another argument is that um, if you look at the biological traits of people in the, in the northern southwest, there are shared traits that uh, by the Mesa Verde population and the population in the Rio Grande. And so this would suggest that they were, in fact, contributing to the uh, biological population. And then the argument against um, the continuity of ceramics 
has also been countered by a, n a number of people suggesting that, well, you know, we really do have some changes in the ceramics that look more Mesa Verdean, uh, with square rims uh, on the bowls and rim ticking. Uh, so there are attributes that do change along with the migration in the 1200s that would suggest that some people were moving in. And Bill Leip um, has uh, written quite a bit about uh, Mesa Verde, and he recently wrote about um, the Mesa Verde migration. And he and um, Tammy Stone and Scott Ortman have all pointed out that not all migration, not all migrants, let's put it that way, not all migrants bring their whole package of technology, of architecture uh, with them when they move. And sometimes people change when they move. Sometimes they take on the characteristics of the people that they move in with. And that might have been a very intentional part of their migration was to fit in with their new neighbors and friends and maybe even family who had preceded them in the migration. And that this was a very uh, uh, intentional decision on their part not to continue a lot of their uh, traditions in the same way. And that helps to explain why some things are not so obvious in the archaeological record because we are base so much of our interpretations on material culture. But if you look at the, the um, even language, as Scott Ortman has started to look at some of the uh, historical linguistics, and you look at place names, and you look at oral histories, and the biological evidence, and the uh, uh, demographic and population estimates, then you can put together um, a stronger argument to be able to argue for the Mesa Verde migration to the Rio Grande. So those are the two sides of that debate. And they're, again, um, they're, they depend on multiple lines of evidence, which I think is a, a real um, key part of my story tonight. And also um, that some things that we oftentimes depend on in archaeology, you know, like potsherds, are not going to be able to tell us the whole story. But we need to, you know, look at much bigger um, cont context of those migrations. And um, so that's the Mesa Verde to Rio Grande migration uh, in terms of where did they go. And then what I wanted to do um, in my last part of the talk is talk about the Cayenta migration a little bit because it's something that a lot of us are interested in because it's, an, it's the Arizona migration. It's something that uh, a lot of the researchers at Archaeology Southwest have talked about. And you know, it's it's interesting because there isn't much debate that the Cayenta people migrated to southern and central Arizona. We are pretty much in agreement about that. Um, you know, I that has that's a major uh, step forward in terms of where we were, say, 20 years ago. You know, we didn't know exactly where people had migrated to. We knew some of the places because they stuck out like a sore thumb. We call them site unit intrusions. They go all the way back to Howery's work uh, at Point of Pines, where there are parts of settlements or whole settlements that were established by Cayenta people and look Cayenta, hundreds of kilometers away from their homeland. They built houses, they built kivas, and they made pottery that was identical in many ways to what they had made in the Cayenta area. So that gave us a baseline. What we didn't know about and what has really been added to the record are the cases where people moved in smaller groups, like individual households, and became part of the communities that they moved into, like the Rio Grande case, except that unlike the Rio Grande uh, migration from Mesa Verde, the Cayenta people who migrated, even in small groups, made things a little bit differently for a, uh, a period of time. So I don't know if it, how many people have seen Cayenta pottery, but the late, the Segi phase has beautiful polychromes. And those polychromes oftentimes have white outlining, the black and red slips. 
Well, the cantipotters reproduced that same color combination with white outlining um, bl of black paint on a red slip in the Silver Creek area where I worked for a decade. Um, it's called Pinedale Polychrome. And it is a combination of Kayenta design along with White Mountain Redware. So what they did is they took attributes of their pottery from where they lived before and they combined it with what they uh, saw in the new place. And, I, and then they made a whole nother ware that was decorated in terms of design layout almost identical to what they had ma made in the Kanta area, but they made it with completely different materials, um, a different color red, a different color, uh, a different kind of black paint, still carbon paint, and that's called Roosevelt Redware. So they actually innovated and started a whole new ware, but you can see in the designs a lot of continuity with the Kayenta area designs. And so, we use these, mul these multiple lines of evidence, the architecture, the, the population change, which we also have in uh, the southern and central southwest, uh, the designs, the color combinations on pottery, um, the way that they built the pots, um, the use of a plate called a perforated plate. And if you, if you haven't heard about that, you have to talk to Patrick Lyons about it because he loves the perforated plates. Um, they're the turning plates that the potters used in order to be able to manufacture their pots. Um, so they put, you know, they would build their pots in the plate and then turn it. And they have little holes uh, around the, the rim. And, uh, and it's almost like breadcrumbs for the migration, the Kayenta migration, because when you find these perforated plates, you also find these early Salado polychromes, and then you also find this white outlining um, of the black paint designs and very often you find kivas. And so it's a wonderful package that we can follow um, as people left the Kayenta area. And it's time transgressive as you go from the Kayenta area to Silver Creek and then down San Pedro area in particular. Um, and with all the other areas now getting filled in. And so that's not really so much a debatable right now. But one of the debates that um, I actually have recently been um, uh, instigating, <laughs> and I had this debate with Randy McGuire at uh, the Southwest Symposium a couple of weeks ago. My argument is that the Kayenta potters were so skilled at what they did, they were experts, that they were able to establish themselves in equal status with the people uh, whose lands they were moving uh, into. So the, the, uh, the uh, first comers, we call the first comers the people who lived there um, initially, and then the migrants are the second comers. And you know, in a lot of the migration literature, migrants are lower status because they don't have access to the land. The first comers usually get the you know, claim on the, on the land, the best land. And, um, and a lot of cross-cultural research, uh, we see potters are not always high status. But my argument, and I made this recently with Matt Peoples and um, Jeff Clark um, uh, at the uh, um, um, AAAs and then also at the Southwest Symposium, and my argument, our argument, is that um, the Kanta people weren't, um, you know, the really on the margins. They established themselves by having excellent potters. Um, they didn't have very many polychromes in the areas that they moved into. Uh, they helped uh, develop a polychrome tradition that anybody could make. Salado polychrome is actually pretty easy to make. Um, you need to learn how to make it, but it's, you can reproduce it. And in fact, Patty Crown showed that it was made and reproduced in most areas where it is found. And so we think that the Kayenta potters were highly skilled, came in and then taught other people how to make these polychromes. They also came with their husbands who were probably expert weavers. We know the Kayenta made incredible textiles where they came from. And they also had a different religion. You know, they had kivas, they brought probably some new ideas about ritual organization. And so I don't think that they were low status. I think that they were able to find a social 
economic, religious niche for themselves, some for themselves, um, that help them to be on par with the other people in their communities. And um, my argument with Randy is, Randy says, well, you know, potters are never high status. And they were commissioned by the elite later, it, who lived in the platform mounds to make this pottery. And my counter argument to that is that, well, you know, after a couple of generations, those migrants were married into those communities and people were making those pots at the platform communities. I think that some of the work that, um, for example, Beth Mixa has done for Archaeology Southwest and for Desert Archaeology Inc. has shown that people were making these pots at platform mounds in addition to at the migrant villages. So after a couple of generations, people had, the migrants had married into these communities. Some of them were high status individuals and they were um, making aware, um, aware, W-A-R-E, <laughs> the polychromes, uh, the Salado polychromes, that um, became very popular. And they promoted this popularity through the use of these in feasting contexts um, both Pat Lyons and I have noted that a lot of these designs are on the exterior of bowls. The bowls are big. They were used in supra-household kinds of feasting. And we think that this was one of the, uh, the social contexts in which these particular pots were consumed and that promoted the rapid adoption of Salado polychromes after the initial innovation by migrant potters. Okay, so it really you know, kind of swept through the whole southern southwest, not just the Hoakam area, but other parts of the southern southwest, all the way to the upper Gila. And this is part of a what um, uh, Patty Cram published on um, it, uh, about 15 years ago, or almost 20 years ago now, uh, in terms of a, um, a religious ideology. Um, and I think that um, that is something that we can really um, apply and look at in terms of the, the, the agency, the nitty gritty of how people uh, were making these and why the other people would adopt them. Um, and that's because the migrants were high status or equal status and they moved in with or married into uh, these uh, local communities and made this something that everybody wanted um, by using it in these contexts of uh, social um, uh, feasting. So that was that's a little debate that Randy and I are having. Um, and I don't know if he'll publish, once we publish ours, he can publish his counter argument. Um, um, the last, the, sort of the, the way to, I want to wrap this up and just um, very briefly mention um, kind of the end of the story, which, because I think there are some interesting debates that have to do with, well, um, the return migration. Uh, the return of the Kayenta to northern Arizona. And um, I think most, most of you know that um, this area was settled by um, Piman speakers. Uh, we, we are, the Ho'okam who lived in this area most likely spoke uh, Piman, which is part of the Udo Aztecan um, language family, right? And Hopi is also Udo Aztecan. And so um, it's not too much of a stretch to think about people migrating from the Kayenta area, going down into this area um, after the migration, marrying in, being part of these platform mound communities, the compounds that we see in the classic period, and then making decision to go back north to their Udo Aztecan um, relatives at the end of the Ho'okam period. I'm not going to talk about um, too much about this, but um, that certainly is supported by many, uh, uh, several lines of evidence, um, including weaving traditions that um, are at Hopi today. Lori Webster did some very interesting research to identify weaving uh, uh, traditions that uh, occur earlier in the Ho'okam area and nowhere else. Um, uh, T.J. Ferguson worked with uh, traditional leaders at uh, Hopi who talked about the uh, migration of people from the Ho'okam area uh, into Hopi. And um, several other people on his team uh, helped look at the ceramics, um, some of the Salado 
designs from the 1300s and the early 1400s are very similar to designs that are on Hopi pottery later on. And so here we have a material culture uh, continuity. And then there are other very unique kinds of designs that um, are, occur on rock art and in, um, on pottery that only occur in the Hopi area. And they've been able to make these connections uh, between the Ho'okam and Hopi that adds credence to the uh, discussion of migration from the Ho'okam area uh, to, to Hopi. And of course the debate is, um, well, what about the ideas of people going south because there is dem some population um, movement uh, that suggests uh, people were leaving this area and that the center of gravity for the Southwest was moving from uh, the Ho'okam area into northern Mexico in the uh, 1400s. So there's that kind of um, counter argument to that uh, debate. And then of course, um, you know, we, um, I think a lot of archeologists see uh, the, um, the Piman speakers of this general area as the descendants of the Ho'okam. So some people decided to stay here. So why did everybody go? Uh, why did some people decide to stay here and disperse at the end of the Ho'okam period? And this is a huge area of research that uh, we still don't have a handle on. There are still debates going on that we don't have enough data to be able to answer because um, we, d we don't have a lot of the archeological sites of that 1400s, sort of a, uh, some people call it the, la the lost century, between 1450 and about 1540 when the Spanish come in, because we don't have very much archeologically for that century to be able to have a really firm um, uh, archeological argument about what happened at the end of the classic period of the Ho'okam. So I think that that's one of the kind of the, um, the uh, areas that we'll see um, opening up, I hope, uh, in terms of research. But I think it's just a sampling, I think it's sampling problem. I think those sites will come up, it's just we ha don't have um, enough sites of that time period um, uh, right before the Spanish come at 1540. So that's, that's all I was going to talk about in terms of my perception of the debates. Um, I'm really interested to hear some questions from you all. Where does the uh, Kachino religion fit into this? Oh that's, a, oh, that's a great question. You know, the Salado, the Salado polychromes, um, especially the decorated ones with um, snakes, um, they mostly date at, at about, after about 1325, which is it, almost exactly when we get Kachina imagery on ceramics above the rim. So, and they overlap in the Silver Creek area. There are sites, you know, around Sholo area where we get both Salado polychromes and ceramics with the Kachina imagery. And I think that they're both reactions to uh, changing uh, social and environmental um, conditions but that they each do it in a different way. And so the Kachina religion, which do, doesn't start at, you know, exactly at 1325, in fact, um, many people have argued that Membres actually has hallmarks of Kachina uh, dancers in uh, the pottery. But it's, just, it's, it's, um, it's a period of time in which things intensify. And it's the way that the, the Pueblos of the North I think, um, d dealt with these changing social and environmental conditions. Um, 1325 is, is about the time period that we use. But, you know, again, this is um, relying, uh, I, I like Jeff Dean's chaotic theory a lot, where he, you know, he's, he, it starts at 1239, but it goes all the way into the 1400s. So by the 1300s, you know, people are in a very, um, chaotic time period in terms of environment. I mean, they've had it now, by that time, almost a hundred years of it. But it's just, there are different ways of, that people, I mean, different religions that come out of uh, these different kinds of social uh, situations, yeah. Yes, uh, I was in interested, is, is anyone studying the, the role of disease or plague in uh, the collapse of these 
in effect, urban uh, societies? You know, Mark Varian did an overview of all the theories for the depopulation of the Mesa Verde, which is the, one of the, the densest areas occupied in the 1200s. Um, and it's in the Leaving Mesa Verde uh, volume, which I highly recommend. I think Bill Doley is a co-author of a paper in there. Um, but there's, uh, he talks about health and disease, and he comes to the conclusion that there really isn't any evidence for or against. A lot of the pathologies just don't show up on the bones that might have been responsible if they were there. And so we really don't have as much information about that. Migrations you're talking about as what sounds like a permanent move as to opposed to seasonal migration such as the Northwest Indians who would move for buffalo or whatever and get to go back. Right, so uh, a lot of areas um, of, the, of the world, uh, including farmers, have uh, a seasonal settlement pattern. Uh, we think that um, many people in this area, particularly in the archaic period, and early, even into the early agricultural period, and maybe even into the Ho'okam uh, sequence, uh, maybe there are some people here who can answer that better, did have a bi-seasonal kind of pattern. Um, but that's, that's different. That's not how we, we, I, we define migration. Migration is a leaving of a homeland on a permanent basis rather than kind of that bi-seasonal movement. So we have winter village or summer village, um, and people did have farming villages, people had farming sites and houses, but that is a different category of settlement movement or settlement change, yeah. Yeah, and, but I, I, it's very prominent earlier in the archeological record for this time period, or for this um, area. Another question here? Oh, that's actually, when did Athabascans arrive? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a great debate. Ah, yes. Uh, <coughs> well, <coughs> Navajo and, and Apache people um, have oral histories that they were always here. And so we always have to acknowledge that um, they don't see the same record that archaeologists do. Uh, very interestingly, and it's, it's some, like somewhat of a coincidence, uh, the earliest tree ring dates for Hogans uh, are in northern New Mexico, and I believe the date is 1541. So it's almost, I mean, Coronado came in 1540, totally independent. Um, and we think, of course, we didn't find, or the archeologists didn't find the earliest. Uh, so most archeologists that I've talked to who have been studying this uh, say, well, you know, probably maybe as early as 1450. Um, so another century before would give us, you know, the earliest entry of the Athabascans into this area. But that can't explain the 1200s depopulation. It's, there's still a disjuncture there. And they were coming out of, you know, out of Canada and, uh, and very, uh, traveling a long way in relatively small groups. So. Well, warfare... Um, when I mentioned uh, violence and conflict, um, there are, those, are the, those are the terms that we're using as opposed to warfare, which would suggest that there's um, a uh, large scale um, battles. The evidence that we have is that people are raiding. In one case, in the 1200s, uh, the site of Castle Rock near Crow Canyon, that Crow Canyon excavated, there were dozens of people that were killed at one time. Um, so I guess it depends on your definition of warfare. And, and w you know, we, we acknowledge that violence and conflict, but in terms of large standing armies, uh, nobody sees evidence for that, um, at least um, that I know about. Yes, I can. <laughs> and this, um, I went to the literature, and you know, it's very interesting because we use the terminology migrant workers, right? But what about the elite, the professionals, uh, the academics, the, the intellectual leaders, um, uh, even religious specialists who migrate, and they have different statuses. And there's actually a whole literature now that is talking about migration in terms of 
um, status as, as an underlying variable of interest, uh, or skill, actually. It's skill, and then the skill leads to status. So I, was, I took my argument by uh, looking at the um, current anthropological literature on migration. Um, so yes, there is. And I, I'll be glad to share the reference with you, if you like. <laughs> oh, we have one right here, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, when there are population increases, are they gradual or sudden? Um, there was a wonderful project that was um, uh, done by Archaeology Southwest uh, researchers, and in fact, um, Bill Doley is a co-author on the article that came out of it in American Antiquity. Right? Yes, good. Um, and it, came, um, it uh, has 50-year time periods. It's hard to get much finer than that. But it has the demography or population size of the south of the southwest uh, at 50 year intervals, and the um, areas that were depopulated up in the four corners show rather sudden depopulation, and then you see sudden increases in the next 50 year period. So they are sudden, and then as I mentioned before, in terms of the Mesa Verde migration. They're just a, they're, they're bigger than can be accounted for by uh, the birth rates that we think these Neolithic populations could have um, produced. And so, they, yes, they are sudden. I, actually, I should have fielded that question to you, Bill. <laughs> yeah, another one. Okay, so the question or the comment is that um, irrigation made a big uh, difference in how population growth might have uh, happened, as well as uh, new varieties of maize coming in. And, uh, could the, if new varieties have increased the um, uh, produ productivity and then increased production or in population? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question, and I'm not actually um, able to answer that. My knowledge of the corn uh, varieties uh, and maybe someone, maybe some of the ar other archaeologists in the room know, but my understanding is that once we have the canal irrigation, that um, there isn't much change in the varieties of the corn. Does anybody know? Yeah, but that's that's my L understanding. Let me just say, I'll try this microphone re real briefly. Um, our in two months, we're going to have Jim Vint here uh, talking uh, about early agriculture in the Tucson area. And we have very strong evidence of irrigation, uh, incredible systems of fields and canals and so on uh, back at th that time period. There, there's a long period where maize is, is relatively small, not particularly productive. Uh, when you get into the sort of the early OOCOM after the pioneer period, say, uh, it's, 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 it's as late as the six mm -hmm. to seven hundred time range. You do get new varieties of maize coming into this area, and, and that mm -hmm. probably does help population mm -hmm. growth. So, th so that's part mm -hmm. of the story. But the to go back to your other question, when when Mesa Verde uh, and the Four Corners moves out, those population data, when you just graph them and show them as kind of waves of of uh, population, as 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 the Four Corners moves out. Um, you get a big bump up in the Little Colorado into the to, to the uh, Mesa, excuse me, the uh, Rio Grande area. So it, it's almost like a little motion picture when you run that uh, in in a PowerPoint. So th I think there's pretty strong evidence of the the kinds of population changes and, and so on. So I will turn this microphone off and let send it back to Barbara. <laughs> but if you would let me do PowerPoint. <laughs> I could have shown it. Yeah. Actually, this is fun not to do PowerPoint. But, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's a, oh, interesting. So the question is, is there any um, evidence for ideas traveling without population moving? Absolutely. I th that is actually the whole crux of diffusion, which is the spread of ideas. Now, oftentimes, diffusion happens with the movement of people, and of course, we like to think that material culture is involved a lot in, in technologies, but you can have the spread of ideas without population movement. That is 
part of how uh, I think that Salado polychrome spreads so fast after its introduction. So the migrants are innovating. Okay, they innovate the Salado polychrome. They make it, they move to, and th they're in all of these different areas, and they're communicating with each other. Uh, we call this migrants in diaspora. Uh, in Jeff Clark and uh, Pat Lyons and I, have, we've all see these as, as a diaspora, and that definition of a diaspora is that people stay in communication with each other. And so they are sharing ideas uh, after they've migrated. They're, they're sharing knowledge and ideas, and, and that's how that religion probably spreads, is through the sharing of ideas, including ideology. So when, uh, after the initial introduction or uh, innovation, then you get this big, big uh, adoption curve, very, very fast, very, very sudden, uh, and that is exact, it has to have been caused by the diffusion of ideas amongst people, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> the, the question is um, whether or not Gladwin's idea about the origins of Salado uh, coming from the whole calm in general, coming from West Mexico um, still stands. Um, and I think that um, this goes all back to this early agriculture um, idea. Uh, we don't need West Mexicans to introduce canal irrigation. You know, it was here before uh, the Hohokam, uh, you know, as archaeologists um, define it, um, uh, was here. So we don't, we, uh, we, we don't need, the, we had canals and that they're almost certainly indigenous um, to this area. The designs um, are a, l a slightly different kind of uh, phenomenon. There is um, wonderful research that's now going on to talk about what attributes or what things do come from West Mexico. We know that copper bells were almost certainly made in West Mexico and not here. Um, so the, the, the ball game, um, copper bells, uh, um, but not the cast ones. There are no cast bells that any archaeologist, yeah, but no, Vic, Victoria Vargas did a very nice master's thesis that was published by the ASM, and, um, uh, Recent work um, on the lost wax process in West Mexico has shown connections with this. I mean, there's no evidence that the lost wax process was used to make copper bells in the Southwest. Um, there is a, um, a hammered copper bells that were made, but not lost wax. That's, I, mean, I think that's pretty definitive now. Um, there is a rubber ball that has been recovered from Hoacom site, that rubber doesn't grow up, up here. There is a pyrite mirror from the Gru site that has a glyph on the back that, couldn't, that almost certainly could not have been made here. Um, Paul Fish, Susie Fish, and Ben Nelson have a chapter in my handbook, my, uh, the Oxford handbook, that'll be out probably next year, that talks about uh, Hoacom actually Mesoamerican and Southwest connections, and they go through each one of these um, attributes. And you know, the, um, there's very little, there is some, there's very little, and they conclude that the evidence that we have now suggests that some people were going into um, West Mexico, and as Pat Gilman has argued, also to the Huasteca area to get birds, macaws, but these were very small groups of individuals and possibly even young men or members of uh, high status households who were going down to get these relatively unique items in order to uh, gain uh, some status for themselves. And it was part of, a, of their kind of a religious um, program. Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's sort of my understanding of where that that whole debate stands now. Kalima, yeah, yeah, right, right. That's a, the, 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 the uh, figure, figures of pregnant dogs, 
Yeah. I, well, I think uh, that could be one of the examples of diffusion of ideas. Um, I would like to see a little bit more um, of the analysis in between, you know, some of the areas in between. Uh, and uh, the Kalima dogs are really, um, they're just charming. Uh, and the similarity could be independent invention. I mean, people did have a lot of dogs around here too, so. Yeah, but that's a great question. Yeah. Glad to see you did your homework. <laughs> Yeah. So all this leads uh, a person to think about the journey. Oh, that's a very interesting question. So the question has to do with the journey, the paths. You know, this, this is something that um, not a lot of people have talked about. Um, but, you know, we're getting close to knowing, like, which river valleys most likely people were taking. And um, some of it is based on these distributions of the perforated plates. Um, some of it is based on the, um, um, oh, Jeff Clark did a neat analysis with um, Stacy Leniel, one of our grad students, that looked at the incidence of indented corrugated as it moves into the southern valleys. I mean, you know, there's indented corrugated at sites near Tucson. So that's, and if you look at it in an isopleth map, you can kind of see w which way they're going. And I like to think that our social networks project has been able to show the connections, you know, the ties that might have been the exchange partners or the kin uh, ties that pulled people and uh, provided those social pathways. And, you know, we're, we're, we're getting down to those uh, very specific roots, I think, pretty well. Um, it, but it, there, there are multiple roots, obviously. Um, but I, you know, your question also brings to mind just the experience that people went through as they were walking, and how much could they carry, and um, and that's the kind of research that we need to think about more because it really gets us to the social lives, um, you know, their lived experiences. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah. Thank you. Barbara, a big hand for thank you. <laughs> thank you.